I'm just, we, we really need to thank the Documentary New Zealand Trust, who um, is co-presenting this case study on Maori Boy Genius. But the Documentary New Zealand Trust runs the annual Screen Edge Forum, Doc Pitch, Doc Lab, Documentary Edge Festival, along with Doc Campus and Doc Community and other documentary industry support and advocacy activities. So thank you very much for the to the Documentary New Zealand Trust for uh, co-sponsoring this session. Um, it's my privilege to introduce you to Petra Brett Kelly. Um, I'm assuming most of you know, will know a little bit about Petra. When I, when I think of Petra, I think of fearlessness. She is completely fearless. And what I mean by that is that she takes on projects because she wants to tell a story and she doesn't stop and go, how am I going to pay for it? Which we'll talk a little bit about later, why that's a bit of a nightmare for her at times. But she's absolutely fearless in her approach to filmmaking. She's off to Afghanistan in a minute. I mean, I'm con for, as, a, as a confirmed coward, constantly amazed at Peter's fearlessness. And that's led to some serious success. Uh, Peter's film, The Art Star, The Sudanese Twins, because you want to make art films in the Sudan during a war. It's fantastic. Ended up at the, uh, it was the first documentary from New Zealand to screen at the Sundance Film Festival and won the award for it. Best, best, best editor. editor. Um, but we're here to talk about Maori Boy Genius, which is her most recent documentary. Um, we're, go we're going to show you the trailer for the film so you know what it's about. But as, as I think you'll know, Maori Boy Genius ended up in Berlin. We were talking about what we were going to call the session at one stage, and you know, it, we came down to battered, bruised, and at Berlin, because there's so much about the process of documentary filmmaking that can leave you battered and bruised. But at the end of the day, you're at Berlin, and you know, you've given birth, and the baby's beautiful. So we'll talk a little bit about that process after you look at the trailer. Okay. What do I do? <laughs> That's a prophecy. And it ought to be his greatest hymn.
thinking of applying next year to go here full time, is that right? Yeah. There are a little over 20,000 students who apply every year. And out of that, I think about 1,500 get in. wonderful young man who knew his own political views and knew what his voice was and I thought this is you know something very exciting here so I committed and then Joanna at, at her company dissolved so then my company bought the project that she she stayed on as EP and as Leanne has alluded to I can't stop it that it has to become this and I do it at all costs and so um, I thought there was something very special about Nato Weta and um, and so I thought, oh, I wonder if I followed him for longer, if I can make it beyond a profile. And I also saw that there was all these other interesting storylines. So um, 
um, I carried on filming, and um, we'll get to the bigger later, but um, I carried on filming, and I started throwing my own money into it, and, uh, and my own time, and, um, and it grew and grew um, through a process which we'll go into later, I could see that it did, it would resonate more internationally, which is what I always want to do, I want to make international films. Um, so, yeah, so it, it carried on. I got, um, it accepted to pitch at IDFA, which is the documentary festival in Amsterdam. I've pitched there before, but it's incredibly frightening. You're in this, I don't know if any of you have been to it, but you're in this huge room with all the commissioners, the funders, and the distributors of the world of documentary and you have seven minutes and then they have 15 minutes to, to sort of shut you down. So it's really intense and um, just before we went on, one of my other executive producers, who's Danish, I said to him, this is really freaking me out, I just because they're bloody intimidating people. And he said, um, it's a circus, I'm going to do a cartwheel, what can you do? <laughs> and so we went on laughing and it was a, you know, it was actually a really great pitch. But, um, so yeah, I suppose, um, you know, and then I kind of, it went on from there, um, and um, even, even when I submitted it, you know, because it wasn't really, I was editing in, in Denmark, and, and uh, even when I thought, God, I've got to submit it to something, and the deadline for um, Berlinale had, was the previous Friday, and on the Tuesday later, I said to Rachel, God, I should be submitting it to something. She said, I know somebody at, at Berlin because she'd been a judge there, I'll talk about her later, but, um, and so I emailed this guy just checking us really and said it's not finished and, you know, it's really, it's really rough and I know that the deadline's have been, but would you consider it? And they said yes, so they did and it got into Berlin. I'm just going to because people might be going, why is your company so Danish? And yeah. So, which is famous talking about the bigger, the, yeah, I think we need to because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Danish, yeah, everybody, yeah. Danish. So I've applied for a film school in Amsterdam called The Binger, and um, it, for 15 years it's been running programs for drama. Filmmakers, a lot of our filmmakers here have been to it, and that's a phenomenal program. Um, and they decided they were going to do a documentary program, which they will never do again because it was so expensive. <laughs> and it ran for two years, and there was nine of us from around the world accepted for it. I pitched a project that I will one day make, and so on day one we were all given an hour to pitch our project to the whole team, it was the first day we all met, and I got up and I said, um, I hope you don't throw me out, but I'm actually not going to make that film, I want to make another one. And I could see the directors were just horrified that this woman from New Zealand had turned up and the cheek of her to then be accepted to the programme, and then say I'm not going to make that one. So I stood up and... Um, and he's, the guy, you know, the head of it um, said, yes, all right, pitch, and we all get a vote at the end of it, so you're either on a plane tonight or you're not. Mm -hmm. And so I stood up and I pitched Marty Boy Genius, and, and then there was this silence, and he said no. And I went, oh, like this, and he went, oh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think they're hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so that was an amazing program where over a two year period they flew us in for five, five times into Amsterdam and um, and then how long? It was between uh, two to three weeks generally, yeah, each time. But we also Skyped a lot and we had mentors. So one of my mentors, Michaela, became the executive producer. Another of my mentors, Jennifer from the US, became an executive producer and are on my next film as well. So it became this amazing, amazing event uh, being involved with the banger. And one of our tutors who came along for one of the programs was Molly Stensgaard, who is um, La Centrier's editor, and has edited with him 15 years. And um, I had never met anybody who, just within one hour, had got my film and understood it. I'd never met somebody who had uh, the potential of storytelling that she had. And um, so at the end of the day, as we were all having wines, I thought, what have I got to lose? So I said to her, um, you like fun too? And she said, oh, I think it's captivating, it's amazing. And I said, would you edit the film? And she said, yes, just like that. And everybody was like, oh, well, you should have gone in there. But we were all so nervous. Nobody wanted to say, but what have I got? So, so she agreed. So it yes. meant that, <laughs> yeah. so it meant that um, I went to Denmark and edited with Molly. Um, and that was an incredible, incredible process. And, and now she's when you took to the Binger and then uh, decided the Binger you were going to do the other project, you were going to do this project, had you already been commissioned by MTS? Yes. 
So, so the film of the so at that stage, kind of a small mm -hmm. installation documentary. Yes, which a you profile. Would be there, yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. yeah. The two collide. Yes. Right. Yes. And so, do you want to touch on sort of how you finance that collide? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, obviously, New Zealand and Māori Television have put in collectively uh, with the license fee and that 150,000. Um, uh, I would say the final budget, if I was realistic and paid myself, was probably 380,000. And um, so, I um, we applied to the DFI, which is the Danish Film Institute. I applied for every independent fund that I was applied for, and um, I applied to the Film Commission um, a number of times, and I got no funding anywhere. And asked New Zealand on the air if they could give me some more, they couldn't, but that was sort of a bit of a wild card anyway. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, I was pretty desperate, so I was doing, um, you know, a lot of juggling with money and doing some jobs, other jobs to fund it, and um, and so it was all kind of pretty disheartening, really. Um, and uh, <laughs> I did, I went and did crowdfunding through Indiegogo, which is a site like Kickstarter, but you don't have to have an American producer, and it's more international. So I raised uh, twenty thousand from that. Yes. Um, I became affiliated with a charity in the US, so anybody that gives me money from the US gets 50% back in tax. And I now have that affiliation, and that's amazing. And when you approach an American to be able to say, I have 501c3 accreditation, they go, you know, great. That's actually the first thing they ask you. Yeah. You're a 501? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, I'd recommend it for any independent filmmaker. Um, and part for a post, Vicky's here. Vicky came on board as an executive producer and part for a post were incredibly generous, incredibly generous, at a time when I was completely falling apart on, on a number of levels. Um, so it was really tough. Um, the situation with the Film Commission was that um, I applied a few times and um, was told initially that um, Māori Television needed to hold back on their transmission for me to get funding. So contacted Māori Television, they wouldn't support that, which is kind of really tough and, and I thought was pretty naive of them not to recognise that they could use this as a marketing tool. Um, so uh, that was really tough. But then Bill Golson said, well, you're going to do a completely different film from that one that was on Māori television, and, and the viewership of Māori television is unfortunately low. Um, so I'll support it at the you know, New Zealand Film Festival. Um, and you know, it's, it's currently you know, in eight, it, it goes to eight um, cities. But that wasn't enough either for um, the Film Commission's cinema release um, prerogative. So um, that was really, and you know, you can pitch overseas. When I pitch at IFA, they're like, well, have you got you know, your own film commission on board? And to say no, it's kind of leads to suspicion. So that was really tough, and I was very upset and really angry, and um, yeah, but um, yeah. Just because it meant to talk a little bit about one of the big challenges, too, of any, for any documentary filmmaker is that you're dealing with so money. What, what we all know is that it's a nightmare. And, and, but there's, there's levels of, there's issues that come purely from the fact that you're working in the real world, mm. with real people. Mm. And this film, like lots of documentary, is, is based on relationships. And can you maybe just talk a little bit about, it's quite tricky when you're dealing with real people to make them understand that yes, this is about them, but it's your film. Mm. And there's the whole sort of interesting dance you do around it control the people's agendas, because everybody who takes part in the documentary has an agenda, the filmmaker has an agenda, there's agendas all over the place. Mm. So how did you deal with those issues mm. with this family, with this boy, he's a minor? Mm. So um, initially when Joanna asked me to direct this film, we talked about, you know, um, uh, being a Pākehā woman, telling the story, um, but with all the films that I make, I never, um, cult, you know, culturals or, or geography or gender or abilities or whatever. It just um, I, that doesn't hold me back at all. If there's something in the story that I think resonates for me, then um, then I go with that. So we talked with the family right from the word go, and we discussed very clearly 
why are you doing it? Why am I doing it? What is the intention you feel of this documentary? And I was very clear about, if you want this to be an inspirational story, it has to be the highs and the lows. And the lows are sometimes more important because nobody will identify with the story if it's just of this, this young boy on this trajectory and he just ticks every box and he's you know, just succeeding all over the place. Um, you know, people will watch it and go, well, my child's never going to do that or I'm never going to be able to do that because God, he never failed and I'm not a genius. Um, so we talked about that a lot at the start and they said, no, no, they understood and they were on board. But as Leanne says, you know, people forget or they say yes, but they actually haven't really, yeah, they haven't really talked about it enough or thought through it enough. So that conversation came up a lot. Again, I had to reiterate a number of times. We had to sit down again and I had to say, you know, you had to sound bored, you committed to this, this is the co fucker of the film and, you know, you did agree to it, we're committed to people. So that went on for two years. And there's a specific, the, the film follows this young man to Yale, mm. and, and there's a, a period in Yale where he's struggling. Yeah. Can you talk about that maybe? Yeah, so um, I, for, for quite a while I was thinking, where is the drama going to come? He just seems to be achieving and, <laughs> you know, gosh, I've got quite a dull film here. <coughs> um, and then we get to Yale and we filmed with him for the first 10 days, but we couldn't afford to stay there for the whole period of time. So we He's at the summer school. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we left he and his father and we left them with the camera and I, and I said, will you film and I'll send you things every four days, I'll send you questions if we could Skype once in a while, da da da. So we started off and that was all fine and then for three weeks they blocked all communications with me and it was really tough and I wasn't getting through at all and um, they were not responding and it was really, really hard. And in that time I went to Binga and I was, you know, it was, I was just thinking, oh my film is falling apart, this is just wasting everybody's time. And I won't put my name to something that I just don't think is true. And do you think he got frightened that he wasn't <coughs> succeeding for a minute, and that he didn't want to share that, or was it his family? It was his parents, definitely. Not only that is an incredible young guy, and he he got it. And I don't know whether that's a young generation kind of concept or what, but he knew exactly what I needed all the time. Yeah. So it was, um, and that's the thing of parents and a sixteen-year-old. They were protecting him. Um, they, you know, didn't want to expose, you know, okay, he is, he is failing here and, and what's going on for him. And so they kind of shut us down completely. So one night I thought, I've got to phone his mother again and I've got to push this. And so I phoned her. And we were both in tears on the phone and I said, look, you know, you have to do this. You have agreed what this film's about. Let me take you back to our first conversation that this is an inspirational story that will take your people, you know, your young people you know, and offer them something, a vision of somebody else's life. That is it. I mean, you you read a book, there has to be the downs, and that brings the humanity to it. You can't back out now. And so she said, yeah, okay, okay. So then she got in contact with her husband and said, you know, we've got to do something. So so after three weeks of no communication, they um, agreed. And then um, when I got the footage, it was incredibly powerful. So yeah. there's a clip that... Um no, he did well, he was in Yale, yeah? Yeah. And he did this himself, you were actually with him? No, exactly, so he, he grabbed the camera. This is after not talking to them for... Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, which is a long time. And, uh, and I'm going to find lucky for it. So I just want to play a little bit more before the actual bit. So you sort of get a sense of him um, and what he's missing and what he's losing. through the night, Ehiro and burping baby, or what? Winding baby? Yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah? 
young guy, um, but just he shot or just takes hours and hours. But he said it became, it became like this confessional. He'd come home and he closed his door and because they really started to fall apart, the two of them. And he'd just talk to the camera, and that's amazing. Some of the stuff that's you know, he cries and laughs, and yeah, it's really incredible. In terms of when you were cutting, I mean, did you have to negotiate with them at all about what was in the film? What was in? No, no, so I, I was really clear at the start, this is my film and I will show you the final, the, the rough cut, at, the final cut at the end, but you do not have any editorial say and I'm very clear with people on that. Um, so, um, no, never, and I was, I, they knew everything that I was, if I was interviewing somebody else, they knew exactly who I was interviewing, I wouldn't tell them the content, but there was no surprises. Um, so we showed them a rough, obviously the rough cut of the Māori television version and they loved it. Um, but then of course I went on and on. And um, so no, it got to, um, I showed them the rough cut when I came back from Denmark and that they were all happy with that. And then it wasn't until um, I was actually at Park Road Post and, um, and I had asked for a number of months if, uh, who was I to put in the credits for the credit for the haka, who should I credit with that and um, and uh, Makareta Narawira's mother was going to check who, who had written that and what or who we should put there and for that I had approval from the performers group I had approval from uh, the event that where I shot the haka footage and obviously I had full contracts with Narawira and all his family um, so I've got to um, Park Road Post and doing the credits and I thought oh my god I have to I have to credit the haka. So I phoned her up and she said, I'll get back to you. And I said, well, you know, I really have to do this in the next day or so. Um, and then um, I got a phone call from Joanna Hall saying, um, uh, Makari, the, the family that owned, that, whose ancestor wrote the haka is withholding all rights to the haka. And I was like, how the heck did this happen? So, um, you know, I contacted some Māori filmmakers and I said, what should I do in this scenario? And they said, what permissions do you have? I told them and they said that then you have every right to put that on. Um, you do not have to get the approval. And I thought, yeah, that's kind of the right thing. So I could be bolshy and just, but you know, I've, I've had a lot of racism towards me through this whole process and I thought, I don't actually want to encourage that. The racism I have had, I, I can deal with, but when I actually have done something that may be seen to be culturally insensitive, then okay. Everything else was just because of this, of the fact that I'm a white woman. So it wasn't anything I'd done, it was just people's perception of me. Um, so then I had a cultural advisor through this whole process, a friend of mine who's worked on other films with me, Chaz Doherty, who lives up in... Um, up in the Uruwera and um, he's a native speaker as well so I ran everything through past him all the time. I contacted him but he was actually in Hawaii at the time and I said this is what's happening and he said don't worry I was in tears. He said don't worry just calm down it'll be fine this is what you're going to do you're going to get Joanna to phone them and you're going to say we're going to you know who, uh, who needs to come I'm going to meet you in Wellington or in Waikari Moana and I will show you exactly the scene of the haka, you will not see the whole film, you'll see the scene, and you'll see, you know, and I can explain the context of, of how it's going to be used. Um, so Joanna did that, and um, it turned out that it wasn't actually the use of the haka, it was the translation into English, because somebody's ancestor was actually um, somebody that the Crown used to sell off land in Uruera. So I was caught up in some political situation that I had no... I mean, I knew of the Uruweta situation, but I had no idea that that person's ancestor was that person. So, um, what Chaz said to me, he said, don't take anybody with you to this week, just go on your own, sit there, listen to everybody that wants to speak, and then at the end, you are to, you know, just do it on your own, um, and they will see that, you know, your passion, and that will see that your intentions are good. And he said, um, they, you know, Use the word mana if you can, <laughs> if it feels natural for you to use, because you know your mana is the film's mana. So I went to Wellington thinking, oh, I mean, I was already in Wellington, so I went to this meeting and, um, and I thought, oh, Lee, I, this could be all over. 
and um, why was it so? Um, but why? So you, you can't drop the scene with the haka. No, because um, for me the haka, it's it, when when it, when it was translated. When, you know, as a to me that's the protest of, of centuries, and and the journey that Naroguera was on was realizing his political voice. And yet he says that it's all in his DNA, and I wanted to show that DNA, and that DNA goes back centuries, you know, hundreds of years. And so in the past, the haka, you know, the translation into English is very political, and and it is very strident, and it and it's um, heartfelt. And I thought that's the parallels. He's he's today what his ancestors were writing 200, 200 500 thousand years ago. So it was really important for me to marry those. Um, you know, those times in him performing the haka, in this particular haka. So, um, yeah, so it went to this um, hui and, yeah, and um, the, the woman from the actual family that, of the ancestor that wrote the haka, she's incredibly generous and we all cried and, and she said, yes, you can use it. Crying and a lot, Kathy. Crying a lot, <laughs> <laughs> tell you. And she said, yes, you can use it, and yes, we agree with the translation, if you take out that person's name. So to anybody who um, understands Māori, they will see the translation in it as without a particular person's name, who is the ancestor who worked for the Crown. So in the end, it was all okay. But you know, it, it was interesting through that process because um, you know it was said, oh, this is because you're a Pākehā. I don't, I don't subscribe to that ever in any of my films at all. It comes down to communication, and it comes down to an understanding and an openness. I believe. So people may say, you know, and it has happened to me in other films that I've shot in other countries. But I say, well, no, I, do, I disagree with that. Um, it comes down to us communicating and me explaining to you what I think it's about and you explaining to me, you know, and coming to some kind of understanding there. It isn't, but I am not stopped by telling any story at all, whether it be a man's story, a, a different culture story, a different ability story, a child's story or an old person's story. That's more something in the story that resonates with me. I was going to ask you what lessons you learned from from Mary Boy Genius that you're saying actually next film. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that much time. Oh. So people might be interested in specific do you think they have a specific question to do with the film or the process? Do you feel by filming the process you have know, being in contact with the boy and the family put it that you influence their behaviour at all? Yeah, I think it's yeah, I think it's naive for any documentary maker to think that we don't affect change because we do. Um, Absolutely, and that's just part of the interplay, really, that you go down. And that's why I always put my name very clearly at the front of my films. It's, it's pretty clear. I've been on this journey, and this is my view of the journey also. That's very clear. I don't make that clear to all my subjects. Is I am not saying that this is your reality. This was my reality, observing the last 16 months. Do you, do you ever think about how it would have been different if you if I could you said you couldn't afford to stay. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Um, look, I actually think it would. I think he's given me more strength of. Um, that's what I was thinking. From the whole, you know, that's the serendipity of of, yeah. of documentary, really, and that happens all the time. And you happen to leave with the right person. Yeah, I, I, you know, the ship was kind of a good thing, really, because then there was this tension between me and his parents, um, and maybe in that tension there was an, this heightened obligation to film and, and he took it that step further and it became a confessional. Yeah. So in the end it, it was um, a positive. Yeah. So when, uh, during that time was it just, the footage was just of him talking into the camera, the dad wasn't shooting? Yeah, you know, like, walking up the stairs while he's doing the dishes, that's yeah. the dad. So I, I, once, we reali once I realised that communication was back on, I sent him specific questions and he would sit down with Nara Ueda and ask questions and Nara Ueda would go, I've already seen all this and that footage you'll see, I've put it in my bed, in my bedroom dad. So there was the that. But during the three weeks? Mm. Oh, that I, that, when they weren't communicating? Yeah. No, there was nothing. So there wasn't even filming of him doing the professional into the camera? No, 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 they did nothing for three weeks. There okay. was no filming, okay. no communication. And how long were they, yeah, for how long was it? Ten weeks. Yeah. That's quite a bit of chunk. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, when I knew that there was drama happening, I knew that there was definitely something going on. And so for me, I thought, um, I'm losing the film. Yeah. Did you think about going back? I did. Mm -hmm. I thought about hopping on a plane and just turning up. Yeah. Yeah, it's getting to that. I thought, well, it was what if one. you hadn't had success, you think? Yeah. yeah. If I hadn't gotten through to Makare to that particular night, then I would have got on the plane. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I know at the end, they would have been disappointed too that those elements hadn't been there. Mm -hmm. And that's also a really important thing, is these people are working, you know, they're working on this as well, and they're investing in it. So, as the professional, it's up to me to kind of go, we need these scenes. You'll, you'll be so pissed off at the end of this process. If you watch this film and go, oh, you didn't do this right, we didn't shoot that. You know, they do. They, they, they're along. The, and so this convincing and this cajoling and sometimes this really, you know, passionate, you have to do this. They will, they, they do thank you at the end. This happened to me in other films. It's been the end of it when you're to pushing and pushing. Yeah. And you're pushing and emotionally. Absolutely. And that's what you're getting there. Oh, yeah, it's really tough because this isn't a friendship. And it's not a work situation. They're not work colleagues. There's some other kind of weird thing in between. I mean, and um, so, yeah, to get really tough with people, it's, it's hard, but that's what you have to do if you want to be true to the journey and the story. Also, don't forget the filmmakers are almost always the nature of what we do means we're there in stressful situations. Yeah. We're waiting for the freaking stressful situation. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, we are slightly parasitic. Way. Yeah, completely. They're waiting for the stress. Yeah. And so that's when people get afraid. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder if you have any techniques when stressful situations happen and people are saying, go away, don't film. I just wonder if you have any techniques to convince people at the time to allow you to stay there and keep filming. Yeah, I, I just, if we, uh, Jake, my cameraman, he knows to never stop filming <laughs> until I tell him. Um, and, uh, it's that whole thing of, um, you know, sort of saying, no, we'll do this and then later, if you really don't want it, then we can discuss it. I never say, I'll take it out, never. Because I think in different times you can, you know, convince people you can show them the power of it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I learned, because on the art start, there was a scene where Vanessa, the subject, comes out and she realises that her whole life is falling apart, her husband's going to leave her, she's not going to get the twins. Um, that she was trying to, the previous film. And she comes out of this, Jake and I followed her into this um, mall in the US where she was buying underpants for an exhibition she was doing. And we got thrown out of the mall, of course, because we didn't have permissions. And so we're waiting outside, and, um, and uh, Jake can obviously hear her on, on because she had the radio mic. And he said, oh my God, oh my God, and I'm like, oh. He said, oh, you know, she's having a conversation with her husband, and her husband's saying it's all over. And I said, okay, let's roll, and I'll talk about it with you later. <coughs> and then he's going, so much she's walking, oh, she's coming towards us, she's coming towards us. I said, okay, let's just let's film it. She comes out and she goes to hug me because we've become really close. And so I let her hug, her, uh, hug me and I said to Jake, stop filming. Luckily he didn't. He put the camera down like that. And then we started walking and, I, and he pulled it up. And I realised then, like we pulled it up, and I thought, oh, Jake, this is terrible, because, you know, she and I were walking on. And I realised then that, no, she had invested in this story, and she knew that this was, because we had talked about it, and it's about keeping the people on track and explaining things through the process. She knew that this was a moment that needed to be in the film. And so I kind of backed away and took her arm <coughs> off, and then we walk along and she's crying, and so, you know, it's really emotional. So I knew that in that, you know, that, that time I thought I did the wrong thing, Jake did the right thing, I did the wrong thing. So in this film, there is a scene where Naroeda comes home and his grandfather, it's really, really beautiful, it gets me every time. His grandfather hugs him and they, should I play it? Oh, we have the time. They just hug and hug and, and the baby, the new baby's there. Should I play it? It's really beautiful. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 
assim. So that, that, that was it. <laughs> but um, you know, I mean, before before another winner and his dad came out, the granddad had his dark glass on, but he was already crying. And I thought, oh, this is really uncomfortable. And um, but I thought, no, no. And so I said to Jake, you know, we'll stay and you just hold the shot, hold it. It actually goes for about five minutes. It's really beautiful. And um, and I'm so pleased. You know, I mean, you know, there, there was an awkwardness. I think in the moment there, the grandfather is aware that we're there, but you know, it's it's such a moment in the film, and I'm so pleased. I, you know, it was I was uncomfortable in that in, in that scene, but you know. Sort of work through that, and I think the footage is this film is stronger because of that. Yeah, but yeah. You mentioned it at the Sydney Film Festival that you wanted to do volume two of, uh, of yeah. Voyage in Ace, and I was curious how that is going, and also if you have an easier time funding now that volume one is in the game. No, so <laughs> <laughs> so um, after Ber so Nardo went and came with me to Berlin Film Festival, and it was fantastic, and he turned eighteen while we were there. Um, and uh, we're in the airport coming back, and he says to me, will you carry on filming? I thought, I'll, you know, I've called this first one volume one, but I'll, I'll leave it for a while. And he said, will you carry on filming? I said, do you want me to? And he said, yeah, yeah, I do. And I said, okay, I think I'll leave you for a while, because we're in the, you know, the bloom of um, the festival and the excitement and all that kind of thing. And um, so I... Um, I just film a little bit, and this year I'm kind of leaving him a bit to just um, deal with stuff, but once in a while I will film with him, just me and my camera. And um, I think the next one I'll leave, you know, it will be like in seven years I'll finish it. I won't do, I won't make it a faster turnaround. This was two and a half years, that's a really fast turnaround for me. Um, but yeah, he's keen and I think there's some exciting things with, with him. But, you know, I think the family and I, we've been through, they're, they're beautiful people and we have a lot of mutual respect and, um, and we've been through so much that I think they've invested in this process, we can't throw it away. Um, and we've had our problems and they continue to, you know, they would rather I was Māori, definitely, and we're upfront about it and it's very clear. And, but I, you know, I have real problems with that. And um, but they also acknowledge that nobody could have told the story like this. And so, you know, we've agreed to kind of, you know, that's that's how we'll move forward. So, um, yeah, we'll see. How many time? Have time for a couple of questions. Does, does MTS still have an investment in the film? No, no. So I would have to reapply again for the funding and everything. Um, but they were happy for you to, you must use the same material that you'd used for their Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the, the contractors to deliver a document for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You have trouble with your, sometimes you have, to get, you have to get their permission to even screen it in a, in a festival or in a cinema before it's screened on television. Mm. But beyond that, you don't have to. Mm, mm. Who's your team on the shoot? I heard you Just Jake and I. Hey. Yeah, and then sometimes if I can afford it, I have a sound person, but usually it's me. <laughs> um, and I like the intimacy of that. As um, Leanne said, we're shooting in Afghanistan, um, my next film, and it's fantastic because it's just he and I, and we can react and do things and go places. And, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. I mean, something I wanted to quickly touch on was, you know, um, what I've kind of taken away from this project, and it's all about the financing because um, it's so tough, and I'm in such ridiculous debt, and and I'm really exhausted by being in debt, and it's, I'm in the worst financial situation I've ever been in my life. So if this is success, you know, bloody hell. Um, but um, you know, with this next film, which has no New Zealand content at, content at all. Um, I am not even going to um, try to get funding here at all. I have now agreed to it being a Danish production. This is the shame of things. Mm. I've now agreed to it being a Danish production and a Canadian co-production. Mm. Um, there will, uh, and, and because of that, um, I have convinced them that Jake needs to shoot it, but um, I doubt I'll be able to uh, have any other New Zealand crew on it. 
um, because I have to spend the money in those countries that are funding it. And it is such, you know, it really makes me kind of angry and very sad because um, I believe that even if we're not telling, you know, a New Zealand story in this country, which, you know, a lot of my films aren't, everybody who's worked with me is a New Zealander. And so we're all hopefully, you know, building our skills and growing together and, and improving together. Um, and we are telling a New Zealand story because it's all of us with a New Zealand perspective telling it. So that is the sad reality of where I'm at at the moment, is tomorrow I move to Qatar to be close to Afghanistan and I, besides Jake, will probably not work with any other New Zealanders. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think that's us for now. Petra will be lurking. <laughs>